Welcome to the second day of our uh, Warsaw Conference. Uh, I'm Wolfgang Krieger from the University of Marburg in Germany, which is a little bit, Marburg is a little bit uh, north of uh, um, Frankfurt and is the oldest Protestant university in Europe. I just have to do a little propaganda, right? Um, <laughs> I've been asked to chair uh, this morning's uh, session and um, we're going to start with a presentation by Andres Guzachenko, and I don't see him. Is he here? Yes, here he is. Okay. <laughs> now, because this is this this is like uh, in a in a television studio, you know, you you only see the lights, and and there are all these gray figures sitting in the back <laughs> that you don't really recognize. Um, okay. Um, we we are going to proceed in the following way. Uh, the speakers are going to stay seated where they are until the, they are called upon uh, to take the floor. And then for the discussion, uh, we'll all come up uh, uh, in front. Um, and this way, the, the speakers can follow the other speakers' uh, presentations and, 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 and see the screen. So Andres Guzachenko from the University of Latvia is first, and he'll talk about um, uh, Russian anti-Bolsheviks in Latvia in the early 1920s and obviously the intelligence angle to that. The floor is yours. Uh, dear organizers, participants, visitors, I'm very glad to participate in this spectacular event. And I would like to present a quite a brief outline, a brief presentation concerning the interactions of uh, Russian anti-Bolsheviks, white Russians, former Russian officers, with uh, different special services of Latvia and uh, with the different special services of uh, 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 of former Baltic Baltic region. From at the beginning, I would like to ask to pay your attention to this citation of a spectacular Russian uh, Russian Swiss journalist Henry Grossen, who lived in interwar period in Latvia. So he was quite familiar with the different processes in Latvian society also was familiar with the, as well as with the intelligence. And he claimed that the Latvia, for example, uh, it was literary, teamed with the spies of various shades. And through the lens of newspapers and word of mouth, as they monitored what was happening in the USSR. Henry Grossen, he was a Russian emigre, so that's why he was very familiar with the situation of Russian emigres, of anti-Bolsheviks in Latvia. I would just like uh, to ask, a bit of your attention just to underline several figures concerning the Russian immigration in interwar period of time. Just to several numbers. It's happened, it's occurred like a, a outcome of a October's Cup data of 1917, also as a result of Russian civil war, and uh, more than one million persons went abroad and settled in uh, different countries all, over, all around the globe and more than 50 countries, for sure concentrated in Europe. Uh, with centers in uh, Western Europe, Central Europe, as well as in the Baltic state. It also had its own peculiarities. For example, quite a wide group of uh, emigres consisted of uh, former soldiers of defeated white armies. And uh, they also settled in Latvia, in Estonia, and uh, Lithuania, as well as in Poland. And if you're talking about the military immigration in Latvia, the main factor of uh, military immigration was the factor of a uh, Russian nor Northwestern Army. The army was founded in 1919, and it, uh, the main aim was the conquer and, uh, because it was the conquer of the Petrograd, but it was unsuccessful. So at the end of the 1919, it uh, withdrawn to the territory of Estonia and stayed there. For sure, a lot of thousands of refugees, a lot of thousands of uh, Russian officers and soldiers was an unexpected burden for a uh, government of Estonia, for also for a government of Latvia. That's why they used to live in a quite poor condition. So that's why the former soldiers, the former uh, officers of Northwestern Army, uh, they were eager to agree for every offer just to improve their everyday situation. So they agreed to uh, for every offer from a different uh, foreign services and foreign armies uh, to participate there. Uh, just to improve the everyday condition, just to um, just to solve uh, just an elementary needs of the everyday life. So as they've got such offer at the beginning of the 1920, when a uh, formation of a former uh, general Balog Balakhovich became to organize in Latvia, 
it was uh, more than 1,000 troops there, and uh, he signed an agreement with Polish army in 1920, and also joined the Polish army in uh, in the Polish Soviet war. But in Latvia, he established his uh, representative office, requirement bureaus, uh, which helped to get out from Estonia, to get out from Latvia, the former brothers in uh, in arms. It was illegal uh, due to the uh, due, due to the peace trust with uh, Soviet uh, Russia, but in any case, they continue to work in Latvia, these representatives, until the second part of the 1920. Afterwards, they also joined, they also joined the military formations of Russians in a in a Polish Soviet war, and uh, continued to uh, combat against the Red Army. But at the end of the 1920, as it's known. Uh, Russian uh, formations were uh, interned in internating camps in Poland, and the situation was uh, similar like it was in, uh, in the beginning of 1920. More than 15,000 people stayed in internating, in internating camps and uh, without any prospect of the future. So that's why they agreed also for uh, different offers. And these offers were given them by the former political let's say, organizer of uh, Russian military units, Boris Savinkov. Boris Savinkov was uh, a former revolutionary, but uh, during, the, uh, during the civil war in Russia, uh, he uh, organized different organizations, and at the beginning of 1921, he organized the People Union for the Defense of Homeland and Freedom. Um, well, participants of the organization were the interned Russian uh, servicemen, former servicemen of Russian, uh, Russian armies, let's say anti-Bolsheviks and whites, and uh, they uh, had uh, very strong ties with the intelligence service, military and in intelligence service of Polish army, so-called Dvojka. It's a second department of the general staff of the Polish armed forces. And um, they pursued two goals. The one goal, for sure, it was the gathering information from the Soviet Union uh, for the needs of the Dvojka. And the second one, uh, they pursued their own anti-Bolshevik goals to establish branches in the territory of uh, Soviet Russia and uh, in territory of Belarus, and uh, also uh, to spread the ideas, to spread the propaganda, and to arrange the insurrections in the territory of the uh, Soviet Union. In fact, it manifested itself uh, with uh, terroristic activities and sometimes uh, with just a brutal looting. Also, they had a certain, let's say, uh, Latvian, Latvian ties, Latvian trace. A lot of uh, former officers, a lot of participants of the Union uh, came from Latvia, as well as, uh, for example, the commander of the, of the staff, and also the commander of military units came from Latvia. And they also uh, made, they founded the branches also in Latvia, and these uh, guerrillas uh, also uh, invaded the territory of the Soviet Russia uh, from Latvia. For sure, a lot of them also cooperated with the intelligence service of Polish army. Uh, for example, the main representative, Dmitry, Dmitry Smirnov, uh, was uh, very familiar with uh, officers of uh, Polish intelligence service of, uh, of Polish army. And soon he became the representative, was one of the representatives of uh, Polish military intelligence in Latvia. And in fact, he is uh, the main, let's say, uh, the main figure of my presentation. Dmitry Smirnov, he was a quite, kind of a very good example of the persons who usually appear in the, in the result of turmoils of uh, civil wars and so on. Uh, in this picture, he is depicted under the, uh, under the red arrow. In this picture, in the middle, is the brother of uh, Balak Balakhovich. They were very familiar. And um, he was quite a suspicious person, unclear person, like adventurer or pirate, something like that. Uh, for example, in the 19th, uh, he was also the officer, for sure, of Northwestern Army. Uh, he, they participated together with uh, other officers in a looting of uh, Imperial Gatchina Palace, but they were monarchists at the same time. Also, in the beginning of 1919, they participated uh, in a capturing of Nikola Yudenich. Nikola Yudenich was a former uh, chief commander of the Northwestern Army. They uh, captured him, blackmailed to get uh, financial salaries and so on for their units. Also, um, he joined Balak Balakovic in Poland. Before that, he was representative in Latvia of Balak Balakovic. And in Poland, he started the connections with the Polish uh, intelligence service, the collaboration with Polish intelligence service. And uh, in 1921, he came back to Latvia. He returned to Latvia. 
and he started uh, the regular, uh, let's say, affairs as an agent uh, under the commandment of, uh, of uh, Alfon Klotz, who was the deputy of the Polish military attaché in Latvia, under the surname Koshkin, Dmitry Smirnov, um, conducted several tasks. For example, he bribed uh, the officers of Lithuanian army and got the secret uh, military information for, from Lithuanian army and uh, sold it to Alfon Klotz, to the, uh, to the Polish military intelligence. Also, the other tasks was uh, through, the, through the Soviet embassy. It was political representation in Latvia, Soviet embassy, let's, let's call it. But it wasn't the embassy if we are perceiving it nowadays. Uh, he, he, got, he got a certain ties with Soviet embassy and also sold the information to, uh, to Alfon Klotz. But at the beginning of 1922, he started, he started, uh, he started his uh, relationships with the political police of Latvia under the code name Tsipkin. And uh, he, in fact, he sold, he sold the, same, the same information which was already sold to Poles. And also he sold the information about the Polish intelligence to, uh, to political police of Latvia. At the same time, he started his collaboration with the intelligent service of Latvian army. It's an operational division, third department of the army staff, quite a complicated name. Uh, together with the both services, they conducted quite a successful operation and eliminated, uh, arrested and eliminated activities of a Soviet spy, uh, or Soviet spy Stefan Gaspari. It encouraged them to continue the collaboration, the cooperation, and they started to develop the project to eliminate the network of uh, Soviet uh, of the Soviet spies in Latvia. For the purpose, they uh, he uh, established the connections with the uh, with the Soviet resident uh, Ivan Soria, Ivan Soria, in real name Martin Zeltinch, former uh, former uh, revolutionary, former Latvian revolutionary. Martin Zeltinch, or Ivan Soria, he was the head of OGPU and the GRU in Latvia, a representative. And, all, uh, and uh, for, for his purpose, they started to sell the information. In fact, the information uh, was based on real happenings, but in, uh, in much more cases, it was forged by the involvement of the officers of uh, Latvian intelligence service of Latvian army. One of them, Jan Strepe, is depicted there. Uh, but it was quite an interesting connection in between uh, Smirnov and these officers. From sometimes, uh, uh, in, 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 in many cases, this information was sold, but the money was divided in between them. So, in fact, we can uh, monitor here, uh, uh, we, can, we can see here a kind of like a uh, scheme of a two-handed scheme. In one hand, it was like a, an operation to eliminate the Soviet, uh, Soviet network of spies. On the other hand, it was like a corruption. It was the information selling. For the, for the money which was divided in between of officers and Dmitry Smirnov. The operation uh, proceeded until the end of the, of the year and uh, during, the, during the autumn, uh, it was revealed, the, uh, this, uh, this corruption schemes was revealed by the political police and in fact, uh, Dmitry Smirnov was arrested. Mitris Smirnov, in fact, became the scapegoat because uh, former, uh, the former cooperators, former officers, denied any, times, uh, any ties with him and claimed that he was a Soviet spy. So he was arrested and imprisoned. But on the other hand, the operation of the elimination of the Soviet spies was very successful. Ivan Soria, or was, uh, Ivan Soria or Martin Zdeltinch was captured and arrested and soon expelled. But afterwards, the network of Soviet spies was eliminated in Latvia. What happened to Dmitry Smirnov? Dmitry Smirnov stayed in prison until the beginning of the 1923 with his brother Mikhail. But afterwards, the political police uh, intervened and uh, freed him because uh, they highly evaluated his involvement of, uh, of, the, com of, the, of the combating of the uh, Soviet uh, military, uh, of the Soviet uh, spy network. And uh, these officers, kept uh, the state and state and army and also developed quite a successful career. Uh, Dmitry Smirnov afterwards, he got another, he got another, uh, another offer from, from the next residents of the Soviet intelligence service, of Vladimir Kaczynski, but he understood that it's a kind of like a provocation or maybe just an attempt to eliminate him as a, 
uh, as a provocator and he refused it. Afterwards, he stayed in Latvia but quit any uh, connections with, uh, several, uh, with uh, secret services. And just a brief conclusion. So uh, the geographical, social and historical context of Latvia was a very fruitful, fruitful soul to develop such activities like uh, activities in uh, intelligence services and so on, which were uh, uh, aimed towards the Soviet Union. Also, the context of the former whites, former anti-Bolsheviks war uh, was uh, quite useful to implement such activities, especially at the beginning of the 20s. And uh, the example of the case study of Dmitry Smirnov, it showed uh, the, development, uh, the development period of uh, special services of Latvia, as well of other countries, which were developed at the beginning of the 20s, and the wide context was quite essential with them. Um, yes, I know for sure also the case of Dmitry Smirnov is a bright example of uh, competition in between of Latvian political service and intelligence service Latvian army, as it's, uh, it's a kind of like a, the usual context in the different countries. Thank you for your attention. It's gone out of business. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Kuzashenko. And we have, uh, we have the next presentation from Igor Kopotin from the Estonian Military Academy. And uh, we're moving along chronologically a little bit to the, um, uh, to the eve of the Second World War. And, we'll, uh, and he will be talking about the activities of the Abwehr uh, just before uh, World War II uh, in, the, in the Baltic region. Where is he? Thank you very much uh, for your introduction and uh, good morning uh, to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to say many thanks to the organizers um, for invitation and this uh, opportunity to speak here about uh, my uh, topic of research, uh, especially uh, thanks uh, for Silvia. Uh, and uh, so my presentation uh, will follow. So, um, so um, the secret cooperation uh, between the German military intelligence service uh, uh, Amt Ausland, uh, the Abwehr, uh, with the Estonian Military Intelligence Service, the second department uh, of the Estonian Army HQ, received uh, quite a lot of attention and uh, became the main focus uh, in the struggle between the Estonian branch of the Soviet Secret Service, KGB, and uh, Estonian emigres uh, during the Cold War era. While the emigres denied such cooperation uh, with uh, Nazi spies, um, uh, as well as the German, uh, or so-called German orientation, military political orientation uh, uh, among uh, Estonian state and army leaders, uh, the Soviet Soviets claimed uh, the opposite. In the Estonian uh, SSR, uh, were published a number of publications and even books uh, exposing it. Uh, one of them was uh, a book uh, written uh, by uh, KGB officer Leonid Barkov, former Estonian citizen, uh, 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 which published uh, or who published uh, several evidences uh, about the secret cooperation between Estonians and Germans before World War II. Also, in the 1970s, uh, a collection uh, of articles uh, or materials was published uh, based on the documents of the. Uh, second department of the Estonian HQ left behind uh, in Estonia, uh, which also wrote about secret military political cooperation. Uh, not only Estonian emigres, but several contemporary Estonian historians deny this uh, even today. Uh, a book written by an Estonian military, or sorry, diplomatic historian, Magnus Ilmiar, published facts about the secret uh, German Estonian military cooperation, uh, even caused a scandal some years ago. Manipulation of the historical facts still uh, seems uh, to be one uh, of the ways for the Russian enemy to attack us uh, today. And therefore, my main uh, research question uh, is uh, whether, whether uh, or not there uh, was cooperation in the field of military intelligence uh, between uh, Estonians and Germans. And if so, what had been the reasons uh, the uh, precise uh, content and uh, the result of it. 
the broader issue is uh, the experience of the activity of the German military intelligence service against the USSR and what can be learned uh, from it uh, for today or how to gather information about the Russian enemy. Uh, my paper based on uh, my research, uh, which was carried out um, uh, um, during my uh, period uh, as a visiting researcher at the Center of Military History and Social Sciences uh, of the Bundeswehr, uh, 2022 to 2023. And uh, one interesting remark, um, uh, I can say that, um, that uh, during the Cold War there was uh, uh, a real uh, clash between West Germany and Warsaw Pact uh, intelligence services uh, in the field of history of uh, writings. Uh, in intelligence uh, servicemen uh, under, um, under the cover of historians and journalists uh, published various books and articles uh, with the aim of uh, discrediting each other. Since the BND in the 1950s uh, was mostly made up uh, of former uh, Fremde Herost or um, Amt Ausland uh, officers, they were therefore attacked by the Warsaw Pact as accused of being former Nazi. And uh, a lot of books uh, were published about um, famous uh, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, but uh, uh, there is uh, no uh, academic research uh, on Amt, Amt Ausland, uh, especially about activities uh, of the Abwehr uh, in the Baltic Sea region. And, uh, I can say that uh, when uh, the national, uh, national Socialists uh, came uh, to power in Germany, the previous military cooperation with the Soviet Union uh, was, uh, came, uh, came to an end and uh, intelligence activities against the Soviet Union began in 1934. Uh, uh, those times, rare Admiral uh, Wilhelm Canaris, uh, head of the Abwehr since 1935, uh, was uh, not very familiar with Eastern European uh, issues as uh, he had been more concerned uh, with the Mediterranean region during uh, his previous service uh, uh, during World War I. It was probably for this reason uh, that uh, he um, uh, chose uh, the German naval officer Alexander Zellarius, uh, who had been born in Russia and uh, had uh, lived there before 1914. Uh, former, uh, he was um, uh, son of uh, one businessman of uh, one Reichsdeutsche and grown up in Riga before 1914, uh, fled the uh, Russian Empire, uh, escaped the uh, escaped, uh, uh, Russian Empire uh, for Germany and uh, served uh, at the uh, German Reichsmarine. Uh, and uh, after uh, World War I, he was uh, active as businessman. 1934, uh, he joined uh, again the German armed forces as uh, an Ergänzungsoffizier. Uh, and uh, despite his desire to continue in the Navy, he was posted to the Abwehr and sent to Eastern Baltic as secret <laughs> resident because uh, he uh, spoke Russian uh, not as native, but uh, uh, it was second uh, language uh, for uh, Celarius. And uh, uh, he was, uh, so um, uh, one uh, task was uh, to build up uh, so-called Kriegsorganisation Finland, Estland. Uh, in order to gather intelligence uh, uh, on the in, in information on, on the activists, uh, activities of the Soviet armed forces in this region, especially information about activities uh, of the Baltic uh, Soviet Baltic fleet, and uh, we we have uh, just one handwritten autobiography of Celarius, uh, uh, which was uh, written in 1945 uh, while he was a prisoner of war in a British camp, and uh, there is uh, no uh, officer service reco record, uh, or records uh, of him, and no portrait in good resolution, because after World War II, uh, Celarius worked for the Organisation Gellen, and uh, CIA in West Germany as a uh, recognized uh, intelligence specialist for Russian and Baltic and Scandinavian issues. Um, do, uh, do, um, to the total terror and uh, omnipresent uh, espionage uh, hysteria that uh, prevailed in the Soviet Union at the time, it was uh, practically impossible uh, for the Abwehr to establish um, uh, own uh, agency network there. 
For this reason, uh, the opera uh, relied on friendly and uh, neutral uh, intelligence uh, services uh, in the region to obtain intelligence from the Soviet Union. This also explains why Canaris visited Estonia several times to establish personal relations uh, with the Estonian military leadership and the uh, intelligence officers of the second department of the general staff. Estonia's uh, geostrategic uh, location with its uh, coastline and border with the Soviet Union played a role in this. Furthermore, the Estonian intelligence service, uh, unlike the Latvian and Lithuanian services, had never spied against Germany. The obver uh, also, also took uh, into account the fact that Finland and Estonia only felt threatened by the Soviet Union, which uh, created good conditions uh, for cooperation. Finally, the obver kept uh, an iron uh, in the fire with Estonia in case the co cooperation with the Finnish general staff, which had begun uh, even uh, uh, before in 1934, um, um, if uh, should fail uh, uh, this cooperation with Finns uh, for any reason, uh, it was a uh, second way to gather information uh, through uh, Estonians. <coughs> the approach uh, between the Obwehr and the second department of the Estonian general staff is described uh, differently in the uh, surviving uh, sources. One channel was the official diplomatic uh, uh, one uh, via the German military attache Oberst uh, Horst, Horst Rösting. Uh, the latter uh, was uh, in any, any case also in contact with Estonian intelligence officers as part of his official duties. In uh, a letter, uh, letter to Frohwein, uh, ambassador, uh, German ambassador to Tallinn in 1938, Rösing uh, emphasized that the relations between the Estonian and German, German armies, and especially the in, in, initiation of the Canaris Mazing, uh, Mazing was uh, uh, chief of the second department of the Estonian general staff, um, ultimately uh, come uh, solely to my credit. Uh, it was uh, by um, Rösing uh, written in, in one uh, document. In fact, uh, Rear Admiral Canaris and chief of the second department of the Estonian HQ, Colonel Mazing, had agreed on close but top secret cooperation between the two intelligence services in 1935. However, Canaris was initially unable to make full use of the military attaches. They were prohibited from carrying out the intelligence activities in order not to discredit the diplomatic missions. The German Foreign Office uh, therefore attempted to control the activities of the military attaches and the Abwehr service uh, in the legations and uh, uh, ultimately, even restricted the activities of Abwehr and SD members uh, under diplomatic cover, especially as German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop was also personally keen to establish his own diplomatic uh, intelligence organization. Rivals, uh, rivals between Rösing and uh, Abwehr also made intelligence work in the region more difficult. This prompted Canaris to uh, promote the establishment of uh, so called uh, war organizations. Kriegs organizationen in order to give uh, his residents uh, greater freedom of action. Their, their leader, uh, leaders, uh, including Celarius, uh, reported directly to Canaris, uh, which demonstrates uh, the decentralized, decentralized, de decentralized I'm sorry, uh, command culture uh, of the Abwehr. The establishment of uh, the wartime organizations or Kriegs organizationen began in 1935 and was completed by the outbreak of the Second World War. In other words, uh, KOs uh, were mostly set up in neutral countries to develop uh, intelligence activities as bureaus, uh, independent uh, of German foreign office. Uh, uh, this um, uh, picture uh, uh, portrays uh, this uh, subordination uh, between Celarius uh, um, uh, and uh, and uh, local um, regional organizations uh, of uh, the Abwehr, for example, uh, first uh, um, regional uh, command of the Abwehr uh, placed uh, in Königsberg, uh, Abwehrstelle Ostpreußen, and uh, Asto um, uh, influenced uh, the Baltic region as well. Uh, in Estonia and Latvia, we had uh, different uh, urgency networks. Um, which uh, worked uh, uh, at the same time uh, independently. Uh, 
So uh, Celarius network, Astro network, uh, SD network as well. And uh, it was a quite complicated uh, situation um, uh, how to uh, German or Nazi spies uh, gathered information, uh, information about uh, Soviet Russia. So, and um, uh, Mazing's uh, first uh, offic official visit to Rear Admiral Canaris took place in 1935, and it is interesting that uh, it was person, uh, pers uh, personal uh, contact between uh, Canaris and Mazing, and uh, already, or, or even uh, 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 Canaris' wife uh, was uh, met, uh, met uh, uh, family of, of, of Mazing. Um, so, and uh, we had uh, several uh, radio centers uh, uh, which were established uh, close to the Soviet border, uh, relying um, to our technical support. Uh, Estonian fin Finnish naval of observation posts were equipped with German uh, optical and radio technologies. Main radio station was established uh, in the main building of the Estonian HQ to communicate directly uh, with uh, um, uh, Oberkommando de, de Wehrmacht uh, am Tausland ab. O urgent uh, radio submitters uh, as an uh, alternative uh, way uh, to submit uh, intelligence information or, or reconnaissance information uh, directly to Berlin uh, were uh, also established and uh, we are speaking about uh, uh, so-called uh, AFU transmitters in the upper jargon. Um, uh, it was also AFU Leute, uh, which uh, uh, meant uh, uh, urgents uh, were, uh, who were specially trained by our Eins, our uh, first department, and equipped with uh, personal radio equipment and uh, placed uh, in the um, on the Estonian soil. So, and uh, here we can see uh, uh, two pictures uh, uh, portrayed, uh, uh, portraying, uh, for example, uh, this uh, uh, the first from left uh, uh, naval observation post uh, posts uh, on Estonian islands. And they observe, observed uh, um, not only movements of uh, or this traffic of uh, Soviet ships, uh, but uh, also uh, via radio uh, reconnaissance, uh, they um, gather information about uh, radio traffic. And uh, so, as I said, in Narva, uh, Tartu, and Petzeri were uh, on the ground. This, uh, um, radio reconnaissance centers established, and the uh, picture from uh, uh, right side um, shows uh, two different uh, radio uh, communications between uh, Helsinki and Berlin and uh, uh, Tallinn and Berlin, so that um, uh, they were all connected uh, and uh, Opwer um, was very successful with uh, uh, development of uh, secret cooperation uh, with both. Uh, Finnish and uh, Estonian general staff. So I, I can uh, conclude that um, uh, the importance of cooperation in the field of intelligence uh, it, uh, is also demonstrated by the fact that uh, Canaris visited Estonia again in the summer of 1939. Traveling with him uh, were two important officers uh, from the top echelons uh, of the upper, Hans Pickenbrock and uh, Franz Eckhardt von Bentewegni. In Tallinn, Canaris met with Mazing and Leidener, uh, commander-in-chief of Estonian uh, army, uh, with whom uh, he discussed uh, foreign policy of Estonia. Um, later, General Kurt, uh, Kurt von Tipperskir, uh, chief of the um, uh, 4th Department of General Land Forces HQ, which was responsible uh, for intelligence, uh, also visited uh, Tallinn afterwards. And um, so, uh, and um, later I was, uh, during, uh, during uh, the Second World War, uh, um, Kriegs organization Finland, Estland, uh, uh, led by Celarius, uh, carried out several sabotage uh, operations against the Soviets. Uh, for example, uh, uh, landing operations uh, with small boats uh, on Estonian uh, uh, coastal line. Uh, and. Um, they gathered information about the Soviet Baltic fleet, and uh, Celarius uh, had uh, several other schools uh, established in, in, on Estonian soil, uh, where, um, where um, um, captured um, uh, Baltic fleet uh, sailors uh, trained uh, against the uh, 
Soviet fleet uh, and uh, used by Stellarius uh, for special operations. In 1944, uh, Stellarius Bureau moved uh, from Finland and Estonia, escaped uh, for Sweden uh, during the operation Stella Polaris with secret documentation. So, and we can uh, speak about successful cooperation between Germans, Finns, and Estonians before 1939. Almost uh, all uh, Estonian intelligence personnel was escaped Estonia for Germany in autumn 1939 and continued uh, to work for Celarius office during, during and after uh, the Second World War. Uh, Celarius office uh, had success in sabotage uh, action, uh, actions in 1941 when um, uh, they had uh, uh, or were supported by local Estonian population. But uh, fault uh, in 1942-44 uh, 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 in actions uh, against the Murmansk Railway or Ladoga Lake or uh, Kronstadt. Celarius gained uh, a great deal of experience of, in fighting the Soviets, uh, which was used by Western organizations in the Cold War. So I finished my presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. We stay in the, in the Baltic uh, region and uh, move to a, a subject which is uh, very close to what you just were talking about, uh, namely Anglo-Finnish uh, cooperation or intelligence uh, cooperation in the interwar period. And uh, we hear from uh, Juho Kotakalio from the uh, University of Helsinki. W where is he? I saw him. <coughs> Great to be here. Um, my topic uh, is the uh, observati observation of Soviet Russia on the source of the Baltic Sea, the anglo Finnish intelligence cooperation from 1918 to 1939. And this research is based on my <coughs> uh, research, which was published 10 years ago. And I will take uh, short uh, uh, comments on, on, on material. Uh, this is uh, in his uh, histories, uh, 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 trying to get uh, pieces all together, and uh, there's different documents uh, all over, and, and, and different uh, countries. There is uh, from Sweden and uh, from uh, Great Britain, uh, from Finland, and then there is uh, from Baltic states, uh, one document there uh, from uh, Russian sources, which are held there. And despite uh, of the uh, documents which are uh, available, there are documents which are not. There are lots of this uh, uh, red label uh, stamps also on documents which are not. Uh, uh, available and some of those materials are destroyed. There is uh, one example from British archives. There was very nice uh, uh, file, but there was any <coughs> papers inside of the file. So they have destroyed the material and so it has been quite difficult and uh, to get all piece, pieces all together. But people are lazy and they <laughs> they make mistakes. And so this is uh, one example from British archives. They have written a uh, document. They have they taken copies and they have uh, uh, take out where what is the source of, of that document. But on the other side of the document, there is Finnish text, Etsivä uh, keskuspoliisi, which is uh, Finnish state police, and this shows that uh, British made cooperation with the Finns. And yesterday it was asked, asked uh, from me that why the Brits were in Finland, so I will go on that. Uh, British uh, Secret Service was uh, established in 1909 because of the German uh, were uh, arming 
and uh, there was uh, this uh, naval race uh, between uh, Britain and uh, Germany. And then came the First World War. And after that, uh, there were different uh, intelligence targets. And the main target uh, after the First World War was uh, Soviet Russia. And here we see the first head of the SIS, Sermonfest, coming. And then there is the green ink, which he used. So we can see, see there, there is uh, material which is related, related to the Finland and uh, uh, Bolsheviks and so on. So they were very keen on what, 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 what is happening in, in Russia. And one of the favorite quotes which I have found is that, that uh, uh, SIS was uh, uh, keen on everything under the sun. But uh, it is uh, impossible to get all information which is available. And the, uh, then there is the time and when this uh, cooperation began. Uh, it is 1918. Uh, 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 Bolshevik Russia was established uh, in 1917. And they made a peace agreement with Germany, Prestovsk, in 1918. Uh, British uh, diplomats uh, came out from uh, uh, St. Petersburg. And on uh, August 1918, uh, Cheka made a raid to the British embassy. They killed uh, Captain Cromie. And the uh, situation was tense between uh, British and Russians. But also the situation was uh, tense between Finns and British, because uh, Finns were uh, cooperating on that time with Germany. Finland had chosen, or, or uh, on, uh, in, in 1918, uh, on la late 1918, chose German king. Uh, uh, he was a while, a uh, couple of months, uh, uh, from uh, October to uh, uh, December 1918. Uh, and there were almost uh, uh, some kind of escalation between the uh, Finns and British uh, in 1918, but uh, the war ended. And Finland uh, uh, liked to uh, uh, cooperate with uh, uh, those who are against Russia. There is a British consul's uh, quote that uh, the Finn is no pro-German, he is anti-Russian. His present German friendliness is simply grounded on the fact that the Finn would be friendly to, an, to a Red Indian if he only fought against Russia. So, uh, 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 at the end of the 1918 and beginning of uh, 1919, Finland became a uh, 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 very close cooperative with the uh, British. Uh, and there is uh, almost 1,500 kilometers uh, border between Finland and Russia on that time. And British cooperated with the Finnish military intelligence and Finnish state police, which was grounded, uh, established in 1919. And this uh, cooperation was uh, very uh, keen and uh, it has been uh, shown on different uh, research. Uh, uh, previously, there is a quote from Christopher Andrew that uh, SIS was uh, dependent on much of uh, its uh, Soviet intelligence on, on the links with the uh, intelligence services of the state of Russia's border. But this uh, cooperation uh, doesn't mean that, that all information would be shared 
there was a British comment that uh, that page number one has not been given to the Finnish general staff. There is a major scale who was running uh, the British operations against Russia. Sign that, that paper. So the threat was Soviet Russia uh, and Bolshevik, uh, Bolshevik, uh, uh, Bolsheviks uh, who, who were uh, spreading their ideas uh, to the West. And of course, uh, uh, Red Army, uh, Red Fleet, and so, so on. And they cha changed their information over, over that. At the beginning uh, of this period, uh, almost uh, uh, 12 to 16 percent of uh, SIS budget was uh, to the Helsinki. Uh, and uh, SIS was uh, running their operation, operations against the Russia from, from uh, Helsinki. First, it was uh, in, in Stockholm. Uh, that's why there is uh, this uh, 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 ST, which means Stockholm. But uh, after this uh, 1918, uh, 1919, they moved the uh, headquarter to uh, Helsinki, but they uh, keep the sign. And they uh, operated uh, and run the uh, uh, <coughs> operations from uh, passport control office, which was a typical cover for SIS. Uh, there is uh, Ernst Boys and Harry Carr who were on the head of the office uh, on this period. Uh, Ernst Boys was uh, very, very uh, long time in in Russia, and. Harry Carr was born in Russia, a uh, fluent Russian speaker. And they used different kind of uh, sources. There is uh, Umit Pyramid, and we can, we can find from uh, resources that they are gathered their information on this kind of uh, sources. And uh, there is lots of people who were involved. There is uh, over 100 of those uh, ST uh, uh, marks uh, which are which I have found from the archives, and most famous of those uh, agents were uh, British-born Paul Dukes, who was uh, uh, given a knighthood uh, on his activities in Russia in 1918 and 1919, and British also sent. Uh, uh, Navy, uh, Navy to the Finland uh, and August Sagar were running operations from uh, uh, Karelian Isthmus towards uh, St. Petersburg and had connection to the uh, Podukes. And one of those uh, uh, couriers were Pyotr Sokolov, Russian immigrant, and Olympic uh, football player from Stockholm, uh, 1912 Olympics. And this was uh, known to the Finnish official, uh, officials, uh, and they give the permission that uh, British could operate in, in Karelian Isthmus and collect the intel over Russia. And 1919, there's an, another example, East Finland mission. Almost 50 members of uh, British intelligence were sent to Finland together. Uh, intelligence on, over Russia, led by uh, Mikkelson. There is more immigrants who were uh, gathering information. And uh, Riley uh, crossed the border, 19. 25 and left there, was executed by uh, Bolsheviks uh, because the Operation Trust tried to 
figured out what happened to Boris Savikov and others. And then uh, in 1927, uh, there was this kind of uh, case uh, 26, uh, and nine of those uh, who were spying for uh, British were executed. And this was run from Finland. And 1933, there was this kind of uh, great spy case. And then uh, there was uh, Rats, uh, Gerius, uh, net of spies revealed, and one part was on, on that, that uh, British and Finnish uh, intelligence cooperation. And uh, it get more uh, tougher to get information over Russia. Uh, at late 1930s, there is one example of that, that uh, uh, Bunakov, who was uh, one of the leading uh, agents to the British were just reading papers and uh, putting piece together. And Finnish and British keep their connections all the time. There is one example from a British uh, instance officer and Finnish diplomat Rudolf Holsti from 1936. Then 1939, uh, Finland awaited Olympic Games, which should be held in 1940. There is uh, Urho Kekkonen, very famous Finnish politician and, uh, and uh, president from 1956 to uh, 1981. And then there is uh, a British intelligence officer on the other side. But uh, uh, Russia attacked Finland in 1939, winter war began, and cooperation between Finland and uh, British continued. And one of uh, some of those uh, people who had uh, worked for British walked now to Finnish. There is uh, Pyotr Sokolov, who was uh, uh, previously uh, cooperating with Dukes. Now he is there uh, helping Finns. Also, Podukes uh, were uh, visiting Finland during the Winter War. And those volunteers who were sent from Britain to Finland was, run, uh, uh, was chosen by British SIS officer Harold Gibson, who was uh, ba based uh, on uh, 19, uh, 20s and 30s on the ba Baltic states. Yeah, and I can end, end for this slide, where is a very, very nice uh, quote that the Soviet Union is ready for all dirty tricks. So that uh, one British intelligence officer said in 1939, and he is here uh, in Finnish officer's uniform during the wind war. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and our last paper is uh, by Tilman Lütke uh, about a subject that I'm totally ignorant uh, of, uh, namely the fact that there were Soviet Muslim nationalists in Poland in, in the interwar period. I never heard about that, but uh, he will no doubt explain to us uh, what this whole story uh, was. Thank you, Tilman. Thank you very much, Professor Krieger, for the kind invitation. Time is very short, so forgive me to begin Telegram style. Thank conference organizers warmly for having me. Tick. Apologize profusely to all Polish speakers in the room for probably terrible pronunciation of Polish names and terms. Tick. Thank Douglas Salvage yesterday for mentioning the term empire. Thank Paul Madrell for explaining so vividly the situation of the intermarium as a result of a de-imperialization of both the Soviet Union and Germany. And finally, thank the conference organizers again and thank you for um, 
in my opinion, mistaking the identity of the Soviet Union or even pre-Soviet Russia as an ethnic state. I particularly thank Thomas yesterday, whom I overheard, beginning saying Sov and ending up with Russia. <laughs> Let me explain. If you look at interwar Poland, it came up with two great ideas in the field of intelligence, none of which, unfortunately, it was able to reap any profit from. On the one side, it should not be forgotten that three Polish mathematicians, Henryk Sigalski, Marian Gradievski, and Jerzy Rosicki, were the first ones to crack into the Enigma code machine so vital for the German war effort during World War II. The second one is something which I'm going to talk about, which is basically called Prometheism. Prometheism was the brainchild of Marshal Josef Pilsudski. And Pilsudski realized that Poland reconstituted in 1918 after 123 years was basically located between two empires. And these two empires, and that's an important fact to note, were perhaps not even particularly anti-Polish. So ethnicity or nationality didn't really matter so much. The existence of independent Poland as a national state constituted an imperial affront. And this affront from the point of Germany and from the point of, Russia, uh, of the, the Soviet Union would have to be set right. So Poland would need to defend and fight for its independence. The one instrument used in defense of this state was, of course, considerable military force. It should not be forgotten, the Polish, mm, the Polish armed forces, although their quick collapse in September, October 1939 suggests otherwise, were by no means negligible in the interwar period. Yesterday I had a possibility of taking a gander at the exposition in the museum, and in uh, the 1918 to 20 Polish Bolshevik War, the Poles were able to mobilize one million soldiers. Even by 1930, the Polish army was roughly half the size of the Red Army. Uh, but on the other hand, the Red Army, of course, had to defend and control a vastly larger territory. The other idea. Pilsudski came up with was looking for and, in his opinion, discovering something which we might call an empire killer. And here I think I have to play the pernickety German and make a few comments on what, in my opinion, constitutes empire. Comparative empire studies is an academic discipline which has come up in the last couple of years. And when you look at what is called the Russian Empire, it is a very good exponent of what we might call an old, organically grown land empire. And as such, it is not only similar to what has in the late 19th century become Austria-Hungary, but also an empire with which I am far more familiar, and which is the Ottoman Empire. What is empire? Empire here I use as an analytic, uh, analytic category. Empire, first and foremost, has a large extension. Secondly, empire is constituted of a multi-ethnic population. Thirdly, ethnicity, let alone national, uh, nationality, does not play a role in traditional empires. What plays a role is the existence of an imperial center and an imperial sovereign who might not share any national or ethnic traits with much of the population ruled over. I remind you that in the so-called Russian Empire by 1900, 52% only of the population were ethnic Russians. It is well known that particularly Baltic Germans made illustrious careers in the Russian Empire However, no Baltic German ever could beat the career of Princess Katharina von Anhalt-Zerbst, otherwise known as Tsarina Catherine the Great. What is needed to govern empire are usually non-ethnic, non-national categories, and in the Ottoman Empire and in the Russian Empire, this was religion. Empire is furthermore 
and this is highly important, um, characterized by a keen awareness of the imperial center of the extent and limits of its power to control. Which means that, for instance, non-coercive means, religious legitimation, symbolic policies, and the like, play a very important role. And if you look at empire, if wisely administered, empires have an excessive longevity. Empires have, uh, have existed longer than any national or ethnic state in history. Empire may, in terms of coercive power, locally be weak, but empire is tough. Empire can bounce back. If you look at the history of the Roman Empire, if you look at the history of uh, Austria, of the history of the Ottomans and the like, setbacks may be suffered, there may be times of crisis, but empire may bounce back. And this is exactly what happens with the Soviet Union after 1917. Paul yesterday described very vividly how Germany and Russia were basically giving way to what he called the intermarium. Now, what is important to note is that if you look at the history of Germany and Russia in the 20th century and beyond, what should also be mentioned is both underwent a process of shrinkage. Modern Germany cannot be called a negligible speck of land, but it is, on the other hand, hardly more than half the size of the Germany in the borders of 1914. Russia today is what is left over from a Tsarist empire, which was losing Finland and Poland and the Baltic states after World War I, and after 1991 was even shorn of a majority of its southern and western possessions. So the fact is, for the first time, we can perhaps speak of an ethnic Russia before that, we could speak of a Tsarist empire and later on of a Soviet empire. Now, Piłsudski's empire killer was the weaponizing of nationalism. And what this uh, consisted of was uh, basically the collection of all kinds of nationalists from the Soviet realm who, in some cases, had been leaders of briefly independent constructs in the Caucasus or uh, other parts, and were basically collected up by Polish military intelligence, and in many cases were simply were funded uh, in order to conduct propaganda efforts against the Soviet Union. Many of them were located in Paris. Uh, many of them, some of them were located in Warsaw. And while we have heard a lot about exiled nationalists from Ukraine, from the western uh, periphery of the Soviet Empire, part of these people also were coming from the Muslim peoples of the Soviet Union. If you look at the Soviet Union, there were three large settlement areas of Muslims. The first one was at the lower Volga, which was also called Idil Ural and extends all the way to the Crimea. The second one was the Azeri people in the Caucasus. And the third one were the vast territories of Central Asia, colloquially in the early 20th century known as Turkestan. Turkestan is an important expression here because it has to be noted that all Soviet Muslims, with the exception of the Persian-speaking Tajiks, were, in fact, Turkic-speaking. So by giving support to exiled Muslim activists, Pilsudski tried to tap into Islam and Pan-Turkism as weapons against the Soviet Empire. Why Islam? By the early 20th century, Islam had become known not only as a religion, but as an important mobilizer and organizer of anti-colonial resistance. European empires were spreading all over the globe, but in Muslim areas, they experienced tough resistance. It should not be forgotten that the Caucasus and Central Asia were about the last territories to be incorporated into the Tsarist empire. 
And from today's perspective, it should also be noted, these territories had, were Soviet for far longer than they were quote unquote Russian before. Conquest was concluded by the 1870s and afterwards, what is important in the terms of empire is conquest may be violent, perhaps even cruel. Imperial rule, however, is characterized by considerable flexibility. And most Soviet Muslim, most Muslims in uh, conquered by Russia were actually accepting the situation after some time and there was a workable cooperation between the Tsarist authorities and local Muslims. The reason why Piłsudski's ideas were not succeeding, and this is to introduce that in two parts of my presentation, I'm speaking of the failure, I'm speaking of the failure of Polish primitivism, and I'm uh, speaking of the failure of the Nazi attempts to use primitivism after 1941, is quite easy to explain. The people having fled from the Soviet Union after the forceful incorporation of their home territories into the Soviet Union were members of an elite. Nationalism was not far spread in these territories. And when it comes to support for emigre politicians, almost all of you are familiar with the raised finger, beware of the emigre. The emigre is fighting yesterday's battles. Things are moving on, things change, and the attempt to um, undermine the Soviet Union by instrumentalizing these exiled politicians was doomed to failure from beforehand. In fact, in the 1930s, the Polish authorities were increasingly complaining. These people were pocketing lots of Polish money, were living the good life in Paris, from time to time churning out a couple of propaganda articles, and that was basically it. Their practical effects were basically nil. Secondly, when I said the Soviet Union also has to be understood as an empire, we should not underestimate that the Soviet Union, and here I thank Ben Fischer for saying, ideology may change, tradecraft remains the same. But the Soviet Union was quite successful in incorporating these people. We have often been speaking now about grand policies, yeah? and you all are familiar with terrible mistakes the Soviet leadership made in suppressing, in uh, starving its population, but on the other hand, we should not overlook that there were other areas where Sovietization actually also meant modernization and development. When, and here I come to the second phase of Prometheism, when in uh, 1941 the Germans were beginning to think of using Soviet minority peoples for their own war effort, I found a document which was qu actually quite prophetic. The idea was to say it should not be overlooked that by now the Soviet Union or the Sovietization of uh, the Tsarist Empire is 25 years old. The younger generation has attended Soviet schools. We see people who have received their education in Soviet institutions. We have people who have partly incorporated the Soviet ideology. When it comes to communism, for instance, the issue is that very often people thought Islam and communism are mutually exclusive. Islam, after all, is a religion. Communism doesn't accept the existence of God. However, if you look at the social efforts, the economic efforts in Muslim societies, a lot of it is actually quite commensurate with communism. When I researched a little bit into that, I was quite surprised that you find Muslim actors from India, from Indonesia, who actually quite conscientiously call themselves communists. Communism had an attraction. I can't go into detail, but if you look at the interwar period in the Soviet Union, you find quite a lot of uh, people who come up with very creative ways of connecting communism and Islam. Now, the important bit of uh, the creation of Muslim armed forces on the, in the Nazi period 
had to do with the fact that obviously in 1941, towards the autumn, it dawned on the Germans that the Blitzkrieg strategy against the Soviet Union had failed. The Germans were hardly able to fill up their decimated units, and increasingly the notion was that uh, Soviet peoples should be recruited in the fight against the Bolshevik system. I go very quickly into it. There was a Nazi infatuation with Islam. Heinrich Himmler was known for uh, praising Islam as a fighting militant ideology, far preferable to pacifist Christianity, which after all was created by a Jew. Uh, on the other hand, the beginning of the Nazi campaign in the Soviet Union was clearly racially motivated. And um, you can see that in Nazi propaganda, how it is transformed over the roughly four years of uh, war in the East. In 1941, it begins as a campaign of decimation, of devastation and oppression against the Slavic Untermensch. But who was even more Untermenschlich than the Untermensch were the Asiatic peoples of the Soviet Union, as they were described. By 1944, um, there were all in all several hundred thousand Soviet Muslims fighting in the German armed forces. Part of them in the Wehrmacht, part of them even in the SS. In November 1944, Heinrich Himmler created the Osttürkischer Waffenverband der SS, the Eastern Turkic Armed Forces in the SS. Now, the date alone should explain to you that this undertaking was a complete failure as well. The Nazis were not even able to cooperate on an equal footing with allies. That goes to states like Italy and Japan, as well as to supposed subject peoples. But the propaganda effort is quite interesting to see how, bit by bit by bit, it transforms itself from the racialized propaganda to the politicized propaganda. Should not be forgotten that by 1944, you also had sizable Russian forces in the German armed forces, a Russian liberation army. And coming to the conclusion, both of these uh, undertakings were failures. However, when I said that empire has a long history, empire has long endurance, it should not be forgotten, empire also has a long memory. And here I come quickly to Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin is a prime example of somebody with an imperial mind. Russia was shrinking and has to bounce back. And the gradual incorporation of states on Russia's western periphery, the gradual incorporation of the Baltic states, of Poland, Czechoslovakia into the European Union first, and into NATO as well, is, from the Russian point of view, seen as Prometheism. And we shall see if this third attempt of Prometheism will end in success or failure. Thank you very much. The name of our panel is uh, Intelligence uh, in the Interwar Period. Uh, I didn't realize the interwar period uh, went all the way to Vladimir Putin, but uh, <laughs> there is, of course, a, a, hidden, a hidden meaning uh, in, in, in this uh, term of interwar period. Um, this is just my bad sense of humor, sorry. Uh, can I ask the speakers now to come forward and uh, take their seats here uh, for the discussion period? I'm very bad at counting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't have a hand free to use my five fingers uh, for counting. Ah, th that's okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers for uh, keeping pretty much to the time limit. Uh, we're a few, a few minutes uh, over time, but uh, we have, let me look, uh, we have until 10.40, so we have a good 20 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Okay, do I see any questions? Yes, back there. So, um, <clears throat> am I asking? Okay, with regard to sorry, Soviet sorry, I was okay. pointing, <laughs> I was pointing in that direction, because I I, I saw him first. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, my question is: uh, Thank you. In the interwar period, was there 
how did Finland and Estonia coordinate their intelligence cooperation with Great Britain and Germany? Because it seems that there was some cooperation going on with both, or is it a question of different periods of cooperation? Okay, who wants to who wants to answer? Go ahead. Oh. Um, thank you for a very interesting question, and uh, I, I would like to say that uh, 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 there was uh, quite fruitful uh, cooperation uh, between uh, Finns and Estonians, and uh, from other side uh, we see how uh, uh, German uh, military intelligence service, the uh, Amt Ausland, relied uh, uh, both uh, on Finnish and uh, Estonian uh, military intelligence services. So we can speak about um, triangle, uh, Helsinki, Italian and Berlin uh, between uh, 1934 till uh, 1939. And interestingly that uh, some uh, intelligence uh, uh, data uh, gathered, gathered uh, from uh, Estonian and Finnish uh, military intelligence services uh, um, were released uh, to the British uh, intelligence as well. And uh, Celarius uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, it uh, in 1945 uh, when uh, he was captured uh, by the British uh, army and um, he tried uh, to uh, sell uh, uh, himself uh, with uh, uh, urgency networks uh, to the uh, Western uh, Allied. Uh, so, and uh, uh, I think that my Finnish colleague uh, will continue <laughs> with this question or answer. Thank you for question. Uh, uh, there was lots of uh, this kind of uh, cooperation between uh, Finns and uh, Estonians and uh, British. And uh, I, I think that the uh, triangle uh, was uh, that, that there was uh, cooperation in, in Helsinki, of course, in, in Tallinn, uh, Finnish and British were exchanging information in Tallinn also. And uh, there was uh, several meetings uh, between uh, Finnish uh, and other uh, uh, countries' interest officers in, in, in Tallinn and Riga. Uh, and there was also uh, this kind of uh, changing uh, uh, intelligence information in in Stockholm. I think that that is one triangle there that uh, Stockholm, Helsinki, Tallinn. So uh, uh, they they had the same interest and uh, uh, but there was also a problem on that uh, cooperation because uh, almost everybody knew that they were keen on that uh, information over Russia. And uh, uh, it has written that in, in, in Riga, th there was um, this kind of uh, market for, for interest information. And they, uh, so, some people sold their information to uh, different people and they get, get money from <laughs> the different services. So uh, yeah, there, there were lots of... Just, just a brief remark that uh, we can consider the Baltic states uh, and Finland uh, in those times uh, like a theater of war um, uh, between uh, intelligence services of many uh, countries. So uh, Soviet uh, Union uh, was involved, uh, Japanese were involved. And um, for example, uh, military attache of Japan uh, in Riga, uh, Colonel Onodera uh, was um, uh, very active uh, by gathering uh, of intelligence information, and uh, he he uh, kept uh, or was uh, in contact, in close contact to Totsellarius, uh, to Germans uh, and Estonians and Finns as well. And uh, uh, after 1939, uh, when uh, Baltic states were occupied by the Soviets, uh, Onodera uh, continued uh, in Stockholm. So we can speak about uh, not triangle, but uh, it was uh, really, uh, uh, yes, this uh, <laughs> theater of, of war or this uh, four field uh, for intelligence operations uh, against the Soviet Soviet Russia and nowadays uh, it is clear that the uh, Russian Federation uh, considered, uh, considers um, this uh, as a threat, possible threat, because uh, from Narva to St. Petersburg is just uh, 120 kilometers. So, 
you're absolutely right. Uh, Stockholm was, of course, the, the real hub of, of all of this, because in Stockholm, all the powers were represented, uh, even those uh, that, that were at, uh, at war with each other. Uh, absolutely. Very interesting point, yes. Um, now, the question from back there, I can only point in the direction because I can't really... Okay. <laughs> um, um, this is for Tillman, Lutke. Is, um, the, uh, Omar Karim. The, you, you mentioned about the large numbers of Soviet Muslims that were serving in the Wehrmacht. Um, and uh, where were they from? Because, you know, Stalin deported Muslim populations from Ch Chechnya and Ingushetia um, on the grounds that they had uh, been... You've been traitors to the Soviet Union, and um, so was it predominantly from the North Caucasus? Was it from Central Asia that they came? Um, the, if, when the United States released large quantities of documents under the Nazi and Imperial Japanese War Crimes Act uh, back in the, I think it was in the late 1990s or early 2000s, um, there were documents in there showing that the Japanese made quite significant efforts to recruit Muslims, um, yeah, mostly as intelligence sources, not so much as soldiers. Um, and so did, did uh, the same thing happen with Nazi Germany? And then finally, um, you, you, you distinguished, I think, between what you saw as nationalist sentiment of nationalist motivations versus anti-imperialist. Um, I'm wondering, is is that really true in this case? Because uh, there were a lot of Soviet Muslims who did not have a strong sense of nationality, you know, Tajiks, um, Twikmen, et cetera. And uh, the, you know, that didn't develop until late in the Soviet period. And even then, Tajiks, even now, you know, it's quite weak. So um, I'm wondering if what is the distinction you're trying to draw between anti-imperialist and nationalist? Thank you very much for these very elaborate and uh, deep uh, going questions. Uh, where were the Soviet Muslims from? It should always be pointed out. It's only a minority, a small minority of the members of these populations who were ever going over to the Germans. Um, the largest body of people came from Turkestan, so from Central Asia. You also had Azeri Muslims who were uh, organized in national formations. And you had Tatars from the Crimea and what was a construction called Idil Ural, Idil being the Turkic for Volga. Um, and Stalin, however, who was uh, always ready to punish 10 people if one person was guilty, was of course taking this to uh, um, as a reason for, as you quite rightly said, deporting entire populations to faraway locations. Your second question is highly uh, pers uh, perspective in so far as um, a Muslim identity and a national identity in principle are mutually exclusive. Islam doesn't think in nationalities, Islam thinks in believers. So the Ummah, the worldwide community of believers, is one and indivisible. On the other hand, there were quite a few, um, as I said, elite members who were already thinking of a Turkic nationalism. To what extent this boils down to, as you quite rightly said, to Turkmen, Uzbek, Kazakh or Kyrgyz nationalism is a very good question. Probably not so, but basically the idea of that being Muslim constitutes some kind of nationality together with an Islamic notion that Muslims should not live under non-Islamic rule which Muslims over the decades had come to accept grudgingly, but which could, on the other hand, be mobilized against an imperial center, uh, is already constituting some sort of nationalism. I do admit that this definition of nationalism is uh, a little creative and probably very uh, wide going, but I nevertheless think it was not completely illusionist to think that Muslims could be used in this kind of nationalist sense against the imperial center. But, but Tillman, perhaps uh, you should clarify that these people were not recruited from their uh, usual homelands. They were recruited from among uh, Soviet uh, POWs that were in, in, in German hands, because the Germans 
had uh, made enormous uh, numbers of uh, Soviet uh, POWs, and they were in the POW camps, and that's where they recruited the, uh, the, these people. Isn't that right? Uh, to a certain extent, that is correct. Uh, the, um, of the 5.3 million Soviet prisoners of war, many were Muslims, and the Muslims were gradually singled out for potential use in the German armed forces, but this was by no means all uh, um, pertaining to all members of the Muslim forces. There were Muslim forces that defected from the Red Army to the Germans, but due to the incapacity of the Germans to treat people uh, correctly, many of them defected back. And it is an unsolved question that the Red Army seems to have been intelligent enough to re-accept them. So the fact is that uh, they always left open a way of escape. Okay, yeah, that's a complicated history. <laughs> okay, next question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I have a little uh, addition uh, concerning Finnish political situation during the 30s. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Finland and Baltic states separately. So that was a wish of Finns. We started in 35 to follow one uh, pro-Scandinavian uh, politics. It was uh, approved by the parliament. And uh, it was called neutrality as well. But Stalin did not listen to that because in the Pact of uh, Molotov Ribbentrop in August 39, Stalin backed Finland uh, under the title Baltic States Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Poland, Lithuania, and Poland. So it was not accepted by Stalin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anybody want to comment or can we look for more questions? I have to look in the other direction as well. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, actually, mostly the question goes to Igor, but also to the home, all the members of the panel. Uh, one thing is interesting from my perspective uh, is how the Germans use actually Poland as a, a point of uh, operation against Soviet Russia. Uh, or uh, Soviet Union, uh, you name it. Uh, at least uh, during the Second World War, for certain, there were operations run from Warsaw. And also, uh, we know the name of one of those guys who were, by the way, the partly Russian and partly German, uh, uh, known, uh, his name was Boris Mysłowski, and German Colonel Ragenau. Uh, and the question is, if you're encounter the name or the operations run by him because they are uh, quite interesting, uh, especially from the perspective of Polish counterintelligence working there in, uh, in during the Second World War in Warsaw. And we are following him, we are trying to kill him without much success. And he was, we, he, okay, was running uh, also very interesting operation after the Second World War, the Cold War era, quite interesting person. By the way, he went to, okay, this is a long story, but uh, have you ever heard the name? And uh, this is the question of Smyslowski and maybe more generally, have you, uh, okay, do you know something about the operation Germans uh, uh, made via Poland also in cooperation with the others maybe? Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting question. And I will start uh, from this uh, second part of your question about Smyslovsky. Uh, there is um, several publications uh, on Smyslovsky case. And um, Tilo von Vogelsang um, uh, has published one uh, research on uh, Smyslovsky. But it is popular. It's not academic. Uh, co consisted of uh, several facts and um, and pictures and, and photographs. One uh, photo was um, uh, was uh, taken uh, in Estonia. Uh, Smyslovsky was has been in Estonia as well. But uh, I I uh, did not found. Uh, I, I I I haven't found uh, documents from uh, Freiburg uh, military archives uh, about Smyslovsky and. Uh, uh, we, 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 we know a lot of um, spies uh, when uh, they 
um, were captured uh, or uh, were not uh, successful. Uh, but uh, we um, uh, don't uh, know a lot about uh, uh, spies uh, who uh, were very successful. <laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> it is uh, quite strange, uh, it is a story uh, uh, about, uh, we, about um, this story we, we don't have uh, a lot of ev evidences or, or, or documents. So, uh, and uh, what is uh, about um, uh, Poland, and uh, we can say that uh, uh, this um, third uh, department of uh, Truppenamt uh, uh, was considered uh, Poland as, as enemy, and uh, this first uh, regional uh, department of the Abwehr, uh, Asto, Abwehrstelle, Ostpreußen, um, uh, acted uh, mostly against Poland, and uh, several uh, 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 so several uh, employees uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, Asto uh, uh, were of uh, Polish origin or, or, or Slavic origin. Uh, for example, uh, one officer uh, with um, uh, surname uh, Horacek. Um, but uh, starting 1934, uh, it was uh, uh, this turn in, uh, in, in foreign policy and uh, Asto have to gather more information about Soviet Russia and interesting that uh, when we speak about uh, memoirs uh, which were written by um, uh, former uh, Abwehr uh, employees, uh, it was uh, written that uh, after uh, Germans um, uh, uh, seized uh, Warsaw uh, and uh, documents of the second department of the general, Polish general staff, uh, surprisingly, uh, Germans uh, uh, said that or, or, or wrote that uh, Pol Poles uh, uh, in 1930s or um, uh, before uh, the Second World War uh, have uh, had uh, no more information or information about the Soviet Union than uh, Germans. So, and uh, it is one point. So that uh, it was uh, very difficult to gather information uh, uh, from Soviet Union because it was uh, um, a total uh, uh, terror and uh, um, a lot of uh, processes against uh, so-called spies. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, it was uh, difficult. For example, uh, Canaris uh, or um, German military attaché to Moscow wrote uh, in uh, his memoirs uh, about uh, uh, Conversation between Canaris and um, um, and the military attaché in Moscow, uh, and uh, it was uh, written that uh, it was um, uh, easier uh, to walk uh, by by one Arab in ethnic uh, clothes uh, um, walk uh, through uh, Berlin uh, and uh, uh, then uh, then one spy, other spy to send. Uh, uh, um, undercover to Leningrad or, or Moscow, it was impossible. So, and um, uh, it is uh, it is uh, difficult. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Germans uh, used uh, uh, different um, uh, possibilities uh, how to gather uh, this inf informa uh, intelligence information about Soviet Russia. For example, we were instructed uh, sailors and captains of um, uh, of uh, civilian ships uh, which uh, visited uh, Leningrad uh, or Soviet ports. Uh, or diplomat, um, diplomats who uh, went to Soviet Russia or, 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 or went uh, through Soviet Russia to Vladivostok, they were instructed by uh, other regional uh, departments. Uh, and one point uh, was that um, when uh, Poland was uh, divided between uh, Nazis and Soviets, it was uh, uh, first contact uh, uh, with uh, Soviet troops, uh, with the uh, Red Army, and um, there were um, um, made assessments on uh, capability, combat cap capability of the Red Army. And second point was uh, Celarius, uh, because Celarius uh, uh, was able to work uh, behind the Soviets or, uh, or in, in the rear of, of Soviet troops uh, during 1939 autumn uh, till uh, autumn 1940. Uh, when uh, Estonia was not uh, uh, fully occupied by Soviets, and it was a second possibility to gather this information. Yeah. Long story. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I had a question. Uh, here, yes, Thomas. well, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for a very interesting uh, panel. Um, 
I have a question for Andre, um, or maybe uh, you could you could just elaborate a little more on the sources. It seems to me is it must be a quite difficult period of time where archives have been kidnapped or destruct uh, could have been destructed several times. How do you go about this project uh, problem? Um, thank you very much for your question. By the way, the main source is, uh, the main source of, uh, of my research is the uh, archive of uh, Latvian political police. Uh, it's a Latvian political police uh, archive kept almost untouched. It was uh, also linked with a, to quite a tragical happenings when the head of the um, political police uh, kept kept it. But afterwards, due to that, the, a lot of people who were the agents were destroyed, were eliminated by the by the uh, by the OGP uh, NKVD. Sorry, so uh, it 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 stayed in Latvia. The other uh, the other archives, it's the KGB archives in Latvia. Uh, the interactions uh, of the former participants of uh, of uh, white formations in Latvia, the former agents of uh, different intelligence services, they were uh, these agents were captured uh, in the nineteen forty, and it interactions protocols for sure. Uh, it's a quite subject. Uh, it's a quite subjective information. It need to be uh, perceived with a huge criticism. Because it's a interactions of uh, of the KGB agents, because uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's well fulfilled with threats, with the physical uh, pressing and so on. Another uh, another part is the uh, archive, uh, which is in Moscow now in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the house of Solzhenitsyn. There are uh, documents there and also in a Russian state uh, governmental archive uh, some documents from uh, from the Dvoika from the second division of uh, Polish general staff who, who was captured and uh, and um, transported to Russia and they are still available and this uh, they cover in, for example the issues of the of the collaborations of a former uh, Russian officers with Dvoika at the beginning of 20s so I, and um, for sure we we need to make a kind of like a mosaic something like that. You need to create your uh, narrative, just uh, uh, to uh, let's say to unite all these elements, and so for sure every every element should be perceived with a huge uh, with a huge uh, approach of criticism. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions, uh, which would have to be very very short because we are out of time now. Very, very short. Oh, poor Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question to uh, Tillman. Uh, you mentioned that uh, empires have a long uh, remembrance. And uh, in, in, did you, uh, here comes my question, didn't you underestimate uh, Polish aspirations uh, after the First World War by saying that uh, Poland's task had been in a, in a security led to defend its borders between uh, situated between Germany and Russia. The, the remembrance of, uh, of Poland uh, could be, and here comes the term intermarium into play, uh, back centuries ago when the old Polish Empire, together with Lithuania, covered all the territory between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, and uh, in so far, intermarium was at least as for for I think for Josef Piłsudski, Marshal uh, Piłsudski, um, regarded kind of as a manifest destiny. And and here we have to di perhaps distinguish between the wannabe empires and the real empires. Thank you. Okay, I think that's a question to reflect upon over coffee because if we get started on this one okay. <laughs> this will uh, take up all our coffee time uh, let me thank uh, my colleagues here up on the podium for their contributions their excellent contributions to our conference and while i'm up here uh, I, I might as well stand up um, while i'm up here uh, of course i would like to thank the, uh, the the organizers of this conference our polish uh, friends who did a, a, a did a magnificent job uh, in in getting all this together and bringing us uh, to Warsaw. Thank you very much.